It's great to see all of you here uh, this afternoon, and welcome. My name's John Holler. I'm the CEO of the museum, and on behalf of the trustees and the staff and everyone involved with the Computer History Museum, welcome to today's event. Welcome to the museum, or if you've been here before, welcome back. We're delighted to have you here today. Our happiest days at the museum are reunions, and uh, this has the feel of a reunion because uh, so many ACSers who are in the museum today and so many of you who uh, have seen us tell bits and pieces of this, this wonderful and amazing IBM story, and we're going to tell another piece of it today. We're going to have a slightly different format today from the one that you're accustomed to seeing at these events. Normally we have a panel here, and we have several people up on stage talking at once, but uh, Dr. Mark Smotherman, who deserves a huge round of applause and a big thank you from us for... for organizing this event from Clemson has come up with a slightly different uh, format and we're going to have a series of sort of lightning round presentations from all the people who are here who were involved in this historic project uh, and then we'll have uh, more of an informal process where we can take questions and answers from you. Uh, I do want to make one connection, uh, a correction rather, to your program today. Mark will be introducing all of the panelists but uh, Herb Shore was not able to attend today, so he's the one change in the, in the program that you have. Uh, I mentioned that we have told bits and pieces of the stretch story, the 360 story, a bit of this story before, uh, but it's always interesting and educational, and we always learn something when these pioneers of that era at IBM come back to visit us. And today, of course, is about a key development in the race for high-performance computing in the 1960s. Uh, the race was partly for technical prowess and partly for marketing impact. It featured two titans of the field at the time, IBM, of course, and also their arch-rival control data. Uh, the customer base for high-performance computing was, at the time, a relatively small but lucrative market. But the halo effect of building ever faster and more powerful computers, or in marketing terms, that flagship product, was already being felt by IBM and the leaders in the field. And it was the search for a flagship product that led IBM to embark on its ambitious development program. And the goal, as you know, uh, many of you know, was nothing less than to make the fastest computers in the world. It's popular in some circles of history today to steer storytelling to the overdramatic, you know, to pit one competitor against another, to have a foe, and to inflate the stature and ambition of the people involved for dramatic effect. Uh, fortunately, we find none of that to be necessary today. <laughs> history supplies all the drama we need to understand the ACS story in context, and if you still need to be convinced, all you have to do is listen to the words of Thomas J. Watson, Jr., who wrote an internal memo with an IBM in 1965 and said, for more than two years, it has been apparent in the IBM company that we were behind in the large scientific area. This is an area where, since the days of our Harvard machine, we have attempted to lead Although four or five years ago, there was some doubt as to whether or not we should continue to try to lead in this area because of the expense and other considerations, at some point between two and three years ago, it became evident that the fallout from the building of such a large-scale machine was so great as to justify their continuance at almost any cost. Therefore, for the past two years under Vin Learson and Dick Watson, this subject has had the highest priority at least at the upper areas of management of the corporation. In spite of this, our present IBM System 360 Model 92 effort is merely a response to the challenges of the CDC 6800 as they have been announced. Almost never have we leaped ahead of them, but merely responded to their lead. Now we have decided to take a new approach, set up a separate team, and go for broke on a very advanced machine in a very short time to come up with something so much better than the 6800 as to once more in the eyes of the public put IBM far away in the prestige league. 
So from Watson's comment, you can see how important it was to IBM management to have a, comp a competitive response to CDC and, of course, to the emerging genius of Seymour Cray. To address this problem, the key technical contributors from IBM, many of whom are here today, whose names have since become legend, were assembled into a small laboratory on the West Coast. Many new people from West Coast universities in IBM San Jose were also hired. They brought in leading scientists from Livermore and uh, one of the ACS machine's early intended customers. This team worked diligently on the scientific and technical issues that they had to master within an instruction set not constrained by the System 360 architecture. And while the project was canceled in 1969 after a great deal of work, it yielded tremendous results within the company. We're fortunate not only to have this reunion today and to have this distinguished panel, but to participate in the preservation of this history in several ways. First is through the Harwood Kolsky Collection, which we are quite honored to hold here at the museum, which is comprised of documents related to the development of supercomputers and micros and minis. Uh, it has a tremendous amount of documentation related to uh, computer modeling, digital image processing, uh, computer programming languages, computer architecture, history. It's a very rich collection. It's 26 linear feet, and it is uh, a rich treasure trove of the history of this era, and we're delighted to have that be a part of our collection. And the second, of course, is through people. We collect not just documents and machines, but people at the Computer History Museum. And we're delighted today that one of the people being added to the collection to kick this afternoon off is from Clemson University, Dr. Mark Smotherman. Mark, thanks very much. Well, thank you and welcome. And I want to thank John and his wonderful staff, uh, including Dag and uh, Karay, Karina, and Jessica, who uh, opened their uh, doors to us and uh, sponsored this event. And uh, it's just been a uh, wonderful reception I've had from them. And I got interested in the ACS about a dozen or so years ago, uh, looking at superscalar processors, and uh, had a lot of help from Lynn Conway, who uh, opened up uh, her archive to me. And, uh, Harwood and uh, people like Gene Amdahl who corresponded with me and so many of you who have uh, just the list would go on too long to uh, to recite today but thank you very much for your help and I uh, hope uh, that an outcome of today's event will be even more of the ACS history to be uh, recorded and available for uh, future. I wanted to uh, introduce the six uh, lightning round speakers, as John said. Uh, there was going to be a seventh, as John mentioned, Herb Shore. Uh, Herb's recovering from a recent illness, and he had to stay downstate. Uh, his doctor wouldn't allow him to travel up, but Herb was the manager of architecture and programming for ACS, and our thoughts and prayers are with uh, Herb today for a, a speedy recovery. The, the six uh, members of ACS that we have with us, the first three are uh, members of Project Y, which after Stretch, uh, there was interest in building high-performance computers as follow-ons to Stretch, and two projects came out of that. The Project X, which later became the Model 90 series, and Gene Amdahl was uh, closely involved uh, in that series, uh, and then Project Y, which uh, uh, was under Jack Bertram uh, at IBM Research. Fran Lynn and Brian are three members, uh, and Herb was a fourth member of the Project Y that uh, moved from the East Coast out here to uh, California to set up uh, ACS. And Fran, I, I'm sure many of you know, uh, is one of the pioneers in programming languages and compilers. Uh, Fran worked with the Harvest Project uh, that was uh, for the National Security Agency. It was a special coprocessor to stretch. As part of Harvest, she developed an advanced programming language known as Alpha. And as part of the Project Y and then ACS, Fran worked on optimizing compilers. In the 1980s, Fran led the parallel translation group at IBM known as PTRAN. This compiler work for parallel processors uh, was world recognized. And in recognition of uh, her cumulative accomplishments, Fran became the first woman to receive 
uh, to be named an IBM Fellow, and uh, as well the first woman to be uh, uh, receive the ACM Turing Award. Uh, so we're we're very pleased to have Fran uh, with us today. Fran holds five honorary doctorates and is uh, a member of the National Academy of Engineering and the American uh, Philosophical Society. Fran is also a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and a fellow here at the Computer History Museum. Our second speaker will be Lynn Conway. Lynn is Professor Emeriti of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at the University of Michigan. Lynn is best known for her work in VLSI at Xerox PARC, uh, and that led, of course, to the famous Mead Conway textbook in a worldwide revolution in VLSI design during the 1980s. Lynn has received many awards for that work, including election to the National Academy of Engineering. Lynn was also involved in exciting work uh, right at the beginning of her career, back in the mid-60s, fresh out of grad school at Columbia. Lynn joined IBM Research and landed in Project Y. Lynn's initial assignment was to build the microarchitectural simulator for the ACS-1 machine. While doing that work, she made an important innovation in the machine architecture that was quickly incorporated into the ACS-1 design and went on to also work on high-level uh, EDA for the machine. When ACS disbanded, Lynn stayed in the Silicon Valley area and after a few years joined Xerox Park, as I mentioned. Lynn recently received the Computer Pioneer Award from the IEEE Computer Society, partly for her work on VLSI design and partly for her innovation of multiple issue, out of order, dynamic instruction scheduling, the architectural innovation that she made at ACS. Our third speaker will be Brian Randall. Brian is Emeritus Professor and Senior Research Investigator at Newcastle University in Newcastle upon Tyne, uh, United Kingdom. In the late 1950s, Brian worked on compilers for Algol 60 at English Electric, and that led to the publication of his first book on compilers. In 1964, he joined IBM Research and worked on Project Y Team. He came to California for the first year of ACS, and then in 1966, he returned to the United Kingdom and joined the faculty of Computer Science Department at the uh, University of Newcastle. Brian was a co-editor of the Proceedings of the Two NATO Conferences on Software Engineering and was a founder member of the IFIP Working Group for Programming Methodology and also the Working Group for Dependability and Fault Tolerance. Brian is perhaps best known for his introduction of the recovery block concept for software fault tolerance and for his work in computer history. He has served as project director for numerous research projects in the United Kingdom and the European Union. Our fourth speaker, Russ Roblin, started with IBM in 1956, and he worked for nine years in Poughkeepsie. He was part of the design and implementation team for several machines, including the 7090 and the System 360 Model 50. In 1965, Russ joined ACS Lab in California and led the engineering group. He remained until 1970 when he left IBM to start a new computer company called MassCore, or Multiple Access System Corporation. MassCore hired several of the ACS engineers, but unfortunately uh, for MassCore, they closed their doors in 1971. But what was unfortunate for MassCore was uh, a boon for uh, Dr. Amdahl, who welcomed those engineers into his startup company, the Amdahl Corporation. Uh, after MassCore, Russ became a founding partner of Adanta, a venture capital firm at Adanta. He it was involved in, with the seed capital round in Prime Computer and served on the board of Prime for four years. Russ left Adanta in uh, 1973 to become an independent consultant and then later rejoined Adanta in 1988. In 1994, he joined Intercal, a new venture capital firm funded by the California State Teachers Pension Fund. Russ retired uh, from Intercal in 2002. Our fifth speaker, John Zazio, I was manager of circuit development for ACS, and he was one of the 20 or so engineers who migrated first to MassCore and then on to Amdahl Corporation. At Amdahl, John served as manager of electrical engineering, and after Amdahl, John has served in a number of positions, including vice president of engineering for Microtechnology Corporation, vice president uh, for technology development for STC Computer Research, 
Executive Vice President for R&D for uh, Adid Company, and Chief Technologist for HAL Computer Systems. John holds 33 patents and has served as a technology consultant on a number of high-speed design projects. Uh, he's been responsible for IC design and packaging, PCB design rules, high-speed circuit design, EMI power systems, and testing for a variety of clients. And he's co-authored a book on high-speed PCB and systems design. He's currently a technical advisor to Speeding Edge as well as Anagram. And for a treat, we've uh, saved the best till last, and we have uh, Bill Mooney, better known to many of you as Billy Joe. Uh, he worked uh, uh, for IBM for a number of years. Prior to ACS, Billy Joe was uh, a program manager for the IBM uh, 1800 uh, computer, and at ACS he led the I.O. efforts. Uh, Bill remained with IBM uh, after the ACS project ended, and one of his assignments was being microcode manager for the tape mass storage system in Boulder. And in 1979, he worked with fellow ACS vet Phil Dauber in setting up the IBM facility in Tucson, Arizona. In Tucson, Bill uh, worked as a product manager for the IBM uh, 3880 DASD subsystem cache and later for uh, the 3990 DASD subsystem. Uh, Bill retired from IBM in 1990. And I'm very glad to have them here with us and uh, ask Fran to, to come up now. I'm really delighted to be here and meet a lot of the old friends and colleagues and uh, to talk about this great project, ACS. But I w w want to start the, uh, in, in thinking about what I would talk about. As you know, I've been in compilers for a long, long time. Uh, and I d decided uh, I needed to, to really focus on John Cox's role uh, and, and, the, uh, and, um, and, and in looking around at some of the very few things that John wrote <laughs> down, I d discovered his, um, his uh, Turing Award lecture which summarizes, he didn't write it, by the way. <laughs> he dictated it. <laughs> and, and a number of people fixed it up. <laughs> but it was his thinking, and he, in, in, in fact, is the, was the carrier of the vision of, of what, and all, lots and lots of the details of a number of, of, of major uh, uh, projects and systems. He is a systems and holistic thinker and could, could pull on mathematics and, and, his, and his wide uh, his circle of colleagues to fill in, in a formal way, uh, some, uh, and uh, what, how uh, he was going to solve some of the problems. So what I'm going to do today, instead of writing anything myself, I decided I would quote uh, excerpts from his, his um, Turing Award lecture, which is titled, The Search for Performance in Scientific Processors. And it's available, it, it was in communications of the ACM in March of March, issue of March 1988. Okay, he, st he starts with uh, the, the, an, an analysis of the three principal contributors to performance in scientific processors are the algorithm, the compiler, and the machine organization. When possible, the simultaneous optimization of these three factors holds the key to the highest possible performance. Of these Three contributors, algorithm improvements are the most important. He goes on to say, my it, interest have been in achieving high performance for a broad range of scientific calculations, not for just a single uh, very important, possibly very important problem. 
Therefore, I have focused mainly on optimizations involving the compiler and the underlying machine architecture. It is very probable that in the future, the highest possible performance improvements must also include the more difficult problem of algorithmic mod modification. This is because parallelism will be essential and the performance of parallel machine de machines depends heavily on the algorithm used and how it matches the architecture. We're in the middle of that prediction. <laughs> we, need, we have parallel, need to, to work with parallel, do parallelism uh, in every uh, way in order to solve the problems of today. And but in today's compiler technology, I'm reading again, uh, is quite sophisticated. Those who build machine architectures and organizations should, in, should design them so the known compiler optimization techniques are easily applied. There's a challenge. <laughs> and we, it's a, cha a real challenge today because of the parallelism and lots of other things. Then he goes on, uh, I would, would like to describe to you, and these are his words, uh, the three most interesting projects that I have participated in. They were interesting because I felt I learned faster during these projects than at any other times. When I joined IBM in 1956, I joined in 57, the stretch project was underway. Designed in Los Alamos, Stretch's ambitious goal was to be 100 times faster than the existing 704. So I'm taking the discussion back, a whole major project before um, uh, ACS. And this is the, is the Stretch project. Uh, and 100 times faster than the existing 704 while providing great flexibility in addressing floating point, uh, arithmetic, and non-numeric operations. Any bit in the machine could be addressed directly. Any word could be monitored. Variable length data could be referenced. And floating point numbers came in many varieties. It was a programmer's dream. And uh, as the uh, person deeply involved in the optimization second uh, section of the stretch compiler, it was a compiler writer's nightmare. <laughs> it was, and in fact, in the uh, one of the one of our the customers was uh, a, a, wanted to was building a uh, early uh, weather forecasting system, and when we had that, we're delivered the machine and all of the software, it took 18 hours to do a 24-hour forecast. <laughs> so, and and, it, and it, was, it was not the machine's fault, it was really partially the compiler's fault. I mean, we would take a big hit on that. So anyway, that had to be changed. <laughs> it was a, it, but it was a, mar, it was a marvelous machine. Um, Next, and it goes, it goes on to say, uh, uh, it, was, it was a very rich uh, architecture. Next, I would like to say a little bit about the advanced, but a computer system, ACS. This was a project we undertook between 1964 and 1968. I know 69 was named, but I think, you know, that it's, uh, as the, in the, introduction, but I think it was 60, 68, actually. But it, as somebody in the, in the audience that was working for me as a summer student on the, on the ACS project said when he heard that it was being canceled, he called me up and asked if he would, would, would still had a job, and I said, uh, it'll take them a long time to stop the software. <laughs> it can stop the hardware quickly. So I think we were, work, we were still working on the on the software um, in, the, in 69. For various reasons, however, ACS was not built. Uh, it, it would have had a 10 nanosecond 
nanosecond cycle time, maybe uh, in, and at each cycle dispatch, we dispatched seven operations, one to the branch unit, three to the fixed point unit, and three to the floating point unit. The fixed point unit could initiate three instructions at every cycle. The floating point unit had a buffer of eight operands and logic uh, to pick the first three out of the eight that, th that were ready. We had two paths to cache, allowing two, two memory accesses per cycle and to match the cache access time uh, to, the, to the CPU ca cycle. Uh, it was pipelined and five deep necessary um, necess necessary because of the low level of circuit in integration. Okay, I'm sure I'm, I'm, I'm getting in far too deep for, <laughs> for a lot of, of us, <laughs> but it was, it was actually a, um, a um, multi-issue a, a, um, multi uh, machine, just as Stretch had been. Stretch had a unit that John Cock uh, and only John could have designed, which uh, supported multi-issue per cycle. 1.5 was was the goal, and um, and they and that was achieved. Uh, so much of our effort uh, also on this system went into branch instructions. That's when everything got, pipes can drain and, and a lot of problems can happen and it, you get, it really can slow the machine down. And so at, it, at the, a lot of effort went in in the design, uh, both in the software and in the hardware of uh, branch prediction, branch uh, look aheads and, and the, all the rest of that. I don't want to spend, I could spend a lot of time, there is a lot of time to be spent looking into these, this marvelous machines, uh, uh, both the stretch and the, and the ACS. And ACS was a direct linear um, uh, development off the stretch, the, uh, the, the stretch work. Uh, there's no question about it. And that that uh, uh, that it need, that that came uh, directly from a lot of these things came directly from the experience on on stretch. Also, what it was happening in between, of course, was that the 360 was was um, being had been was being built and uh, delivered in 1964, which was was the same year that we were starting ACS. But, and that may, may, have, may have complicated things a bit. <laughs> there are people here who probably know more about that than, uh, than I do. Long before we had a firm hardware design on ACS, we had an experimental optimizing compiler to evaluate variants of the design. This was built as part of Project Y. Um, I and several others moved from the stretch harvest work directly onto Project Y, the beginnings and the precursor to ACS, and, and built um, a, 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 a compiler, a machine-independent, uh, language-independent compiler in order to facilitate the uh, analysis of programs and to determine uh, what the characteristics of the target architecture. Uh, for ACS, and uh, how many uh, you know, how many uh, registers it would, would be good, what the the lo loads and loads of other things, and there were timing simulators. A bit, in fact, timing simulators go back to a piece of work that John Cock did uh, in 1955 uh, in for Stretch. So that had also that played a very major role in, in uh, all of this work. And here, going back to what jo John says, is long before we had a firm hardware design, we had an experimental optimizing compiler to evaluate the variance of the design. Working with a combined team of compiler and hardware people, I learned, I being uh, John Cock, I learned the importance of not including hardware features that the compiler could not use 
and including, <laughs> and including hardware, for, hardware facilities to uh, uh, allow efficient compilation. <laughs> this experimental compiler was the source of much of our subsequent work on optimization algorithms. Many of the code optimization methods used in compilers today came from this work. They, these include interval-based control flow analysis, data flow analysis, common sub-expression elimination, blah, blah, blah. And on occasion, the compiler was able to uh, generate better code for ACS than the best hand coders. We had uh, Hirondo Kuki's uh, students uh, from the University of Chicago. Uh, we gave them some kernels, and they were to work on them over the summer. And they all came out for a visit here in, um, on Sand Hill Road, where we were located. And we, we, we uh, analyzed. We had a great timing, uh, a great timing uh, simulator and analyzed it, and we could just in, throw the, the kernel in through our compiler and, and beat cycle times, the, the students' uh, uh, sequence of code that they had labored on all summer. <laughs> but it was really because we under, knew the machine and knew the tricks, and it's, and it's kind of an indicator that there's po it would be possible, I think, to build computers um, uh, uh, compilers that can learn uh, uh, the, 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 the systems that they're compiling for. Okay, I may have run over my time. I wasn't looking at this watch here. Uh, so, but then John says, ACS never made it out of the laboratory. I suppose it was too big and too expensive. But for me, it was probably the most exciting project I have ever been involved in. So that's a, that's a giant statement from a giant man. In reflecting on this, I believe that what made it particularly exciting was that we were a small team, mostly hand-picked, and we pioneered every aspect of the project. So that's, that's one of the very exciting facts about ACS and about those, the, er, the earlier projects, and, and I, he also, and this is my, my last statement, I'll quote from this wonderful paper. He says, my only regret about ACS is that, that unlike compiler ideas, we did not take the time to publish our ideas on hardware so others could build on them. Thank you. Good afternoon, folks. It's uh, really great to be with, here with you today. And uh, many, many thanks to the Computer History Museum for hosting this uh, ACS reunion, I think uh, most of us uh, think of it. You know, there are many ACS veterans in the audience, and uh, we're all really looking forward to getting together at the uh, reception later and making uh, and reconnecting with each other. I have to think back. Uh, to how I got involved in this uh, amazing project. And it all started when I took a, uh, an advanced programming course at Columbia University. It was taught by uh, a fellow from uh, Yorktown Heights, an adjunct faculty member named Herb Shore. And during that course, uh, we covered a lot of uh, current research that was underway. And uh, I got particularly fascinated with uh, some work that Maurice Wilkes was doing at Cambridge Mathematical Laboratory. He'd, he'd uh, written some internal uh, technical reports on uh, self-compiling compilers. And uh, started reading them, and uh, I'd never built a compiler, uh, of course, and, uh, but I started looking at this, and it's compilers for a little list processing language. And I thought, wow, not only could I build a compiler, but I could build a self-compiling compiler. So I did this on the IBM 1620 and it's a little independent study for Herb and did some further work with it. And uh, it was a great course and I thought nothing more about it. And uh, the next thing you know, I was uh, asked to join IBM Research at Yorktown Heights, uh, fresh out of graduate school, and ended up being tapped to join Project Y. And I, I was really just glad to, to have a job. 
<laughs> and, uh, but there I was on Project Y right when it was about to take off in uh, early 65. And uh, as a very junior project member, uh, my job was to model a machine architecture in a timing simulator uh, using a simulation method that had been created by Don Rosenberg and Bob Rickard. Um, now you can imagine how exciting this was for me as a young staff member to sit in on brainstorming sessions with folks like John Cock and Herb Shore, uh, Dick Arnold, Ed Sussenguth, Phil Dauber, Charlie Fryman, and a number of others right at this um, early critical period when the machine architecture was being um, uh, brainstormed about, a lot of different ideas are being tried out. I learned a, a lot about machine architecture while building the simulator. And interestingly, the architecture team began relying on the timing simulator to document some of the rather tricky detailed design decisions, especially as simulation runs began occasionally uh, uncovering glitches in the design. So you can see something was kind of happening there in terms of the use of a simulator to, uh, to begin to actually be a, a, a kind of running document of the design decisions. The initial design uh, had multiple pipeline functional units, several adders, multiplier, divider. Um, these were pipeline. Uh, and, and it had potentially a, a very high throughput rate. You know, if you could somehow feed instructions to each of these units every cycle. Uh, even though there was delays in them percolating through a pipeline unit, uh, the bandwidth, uh, the throughput rate could be very high. And, uh, but even though there were um, instruction streams for index and arithmetic operations, and a look ahead into a secondary instruction register if the pending instruction was stalled in the arithmetic unit, um, there, was, there was still a, a big bottleneck at this instruction issuancing point. And at some point, John Cock began asking, why can't we get this machine to average, average more than one instruction for a machine cycle? And uh, now you have to remember now, I was you know, just out of school, uh, had a master's degree, joined this project. I had no idea this was a research question <laughs> or the current theory said that it probably couldn't be done. So I was so naive and inexperienced that I thought that it was just a design challenge John tossed out to the group. You know, they'd been handling a lot of design challenges, and many of them had uh, have been generated by John. Well, anyway, I began obsessing over that question, kind of like I did over the, uh, the uh, self-compiling compiler work at Columbia, thinking maybe I could figure it out. And uh, I began just mulling it over on the side, trying to visualize how to represent and, and test all the source destination conflicts between uh, pending instructions. Uh, shortly after we transferred uh, the ACS project form, we transferred out to uh, Kiefer Road in California, I hit on how to do it. And how to do it, and importantly, how to do it using limited levels of logic. The machine was designed to go fast. It had fairly shallow logic, so the machine cycle time could be very fast. The scheme drew on kind of a scattering of ideas uh, from queuing theory, matrix algebra, uh, number theory, uh, and then of course switching theory and logic design, and importantly circuit design. Things I'd just been studying at Columbia, where they had a really great early uh, department uh, in electrical engineering that had just a, a many, many, many courses that covered all across computer science and engineering at the time. Anyway, the key was to hold instructions, the pending instructions, in, in queues or a queue and represent the instruction source and destination registers in unary positional form rather than in binary form. And then conflicts among the sources and destinations could be resolved by scanning up and down columns in the instruction queues. And that could be done using shallow logic that exploited the .or capability of the ASCS's echo logic circuitry, the, the, the current switching uh, logic circuits. So this dynamic instruction scheduling, as Brian Randall 
uh, called it, named it. Uh, it was a perfect name for it. It's kind of like, this is something kind of different. Well, it's dynamic and it schedules instructions. And uh, this, this dynamic instruction scheduling hardware required huge numbers of circuits. But the logic was cleanly organized and regular, very regular arrays of logic that were quite shallow. Um, and it had the potential, even though it had a lot of transistors, it had the potential to speed up an overall machine that had many times the circuit count of the issuance hardware. So you can see that it might make some sense to do that. Well, stepping back from that, that's sort of like one thing that was going on. Many such innovations coalesced in the ACS-1 design to create what, on reflection, uh, appears to be the first superscalar computer design or paradigm, kind of looking at it from the, the modern point of view. And there weren't only innovations in hardware architecture, but also in everything from instruction set architecture through to machine-dependent, machine-independent compilation. So there's a very large array of things being worked on simultaneously. By uh, early uh, 66, the dynamic instruction scheduling had been incorporated into the design. And as the design firmed up, uh, attention shifted to tuning the machine's architectural parameters to maximize its throughput. You know, you said, an idea of how to do some of these things, but, but well, if you have a queue, how deep should it be? Uh, how many instructions could you issue out of order out of it each machine cycle? There was sort of a parameterization issue. As part of that effort, we ran timing simulations, uh, as Fran had referred to, and, and using code generated in the compiler work that Fran, Ellen, and Jim Beatty, and John Cock were doing as a parallel activity. And in, in making those runs, normalizing results using critical path logic design iterations being done in engineering by Merle Homan. Those simulations led us, for example, one, one of the results led us to the three out of eight instruction window as providing the best trade-off of instructions issued per machine cycle versus the level of, levels of logic used. And three out of eight is, is, is a not uncommon window even today. Um, at some point, as people sort of collectively uh, all across ACS began thinking about the complexity of the machine, uh, many began thinking about the difficulties in bringing up and testing such a complex machine. And, and I became interested in that problem too from an architectural perspective. Uh, reflecting back, uh, even by then computer design had become so complex that separate specialists, groups of specialists, did hardware architecture logic design, circuit design, and the packaging and manufacturing design. And uh, designs at one level tended to be kind of tossed over the wall to the next group. There would be people that, that had knowledge about the adjacent technologies and things in development, but remember, there were rapid advances being made in every one of these areas, so it typically wouldn't be possible for someone to, to bridge all of that because it was all moving forward at the same time. And, and it was interesting, in a design culture like that, it might go unnoticed that circuit level tricks, such as the echo.org connections, might, might hold a key that would enable an architectural innovation to be made, et cetera, et cetera, all across that space. So at some point, I proposed a design of the ACS design process that included formal specification of machine architecture in a timing simulator. Uh, partitions of which could be used to generate the interface trace signals inputs for logic simulation down at the next level. IBM had a lot of work going on then in, in development of uh, powerful logic simulators. And then, and then those trace signals could also be applied later for testing of hardware partitions. And, and uh, the, the design process provided also a framework for really thinking about doing innovations in, uh, and doing simulations in a, a sort of hierarchy of multiple design abstractions where maybe one partition of the machine is further ahead in the design than another. And I uh, uh, produced a paper on that that, that uh, got some circulation in IBM. And, uh, and, uh, and at that point, 
right around that time, the project started coming apart. Now, I was, I was so junior that I had no clue about the, uh, the business situation the project was in, uh, the, the, the 360 versus uh, ACS1 controversy and so forth. I'd just been doing this, uh, this technical work. And uh, at that point, right around the time when the project was, uh, was, was kind of winding down, I left IBM and went on to other adventures in the Valley. But uh, looking back, I think it was these experiences in computer architecture and design automation and, and working uh, in an environment where you're being asked questions like the ones John always asked, uh, that, that really, this all greatly influenced my later work and, and provided a foundation for the structured VLSI design methods later launched at Xerox Park and Caltech. And uh, as I think about that, I feel a really uh, unusual uh, sense of career closure and how this all kind of played out in my own career. Because if you sort of think of it, the later work on VLSI design helped this old dynamic instruction scheduling uh, innovation to finally come to life in actual machines, and, and namely in modern microprocessors, where modern microprocessors essentially have the power of the supercomputer computers of uh, the 60s. And uh, better yet, it all happened, uh, and I was still around to see it happen. <laughs> anyway, uh, it's really great to, to, to join with the other vets here today and uh, share our memories about that, uh, that really amazing project. Thank you. It really is great to be back here. Uh, the time I spent with IBM on the East Coast and the West Coast was one of the great periods in, in my career. There are many people to thank. John Cock was my first manager. Anybody who knows John Cock thinks of that as, as, as amazing. Uh, that, that, that he could manage anything and that anybody could manage me. <laughs> I was astonished a few years ago when Mark Motherman um, contacted me out of the blue, uh, asked, uh, were you the Randall who worked at IBM in the 1960s? Uh, and I said, guilty my lad. Uh, and um, even more uh, astonished when um, he was obviously um, uh, rather excited about this um, uh, memo that I could remember um, called dynamic construction scheduling. Um, his enthusiasm for that um, uh, was all to do with what he called superscalar processors. Let me now admit that I had to ask him, what is a superscalar processor? Um, but I had another reason. I soon had another reason for being uh, em embarrassed, um, a reason which sh uh, uh, should not have surprised me. Uh, I had a very clear memory um, of uh, the um, memo that uh, uh, Lynn mentioned. Um, I must admit, um, uh, I had not known who had, t uh, who had written the, the title for the memo. Uh, I'm, I'm quite willing to claim the credit now that it's been offered to me. Uh, um, but uh, I had a very clear memor uh, memory uh, that that was a memo uh, by um, Don Senzig and myself. Now, as a com card-carrying computer historian in, subject, in, in subsequent years, um, I learnt that the human memory is extremely fallible, <laughs> my own included. Um, and it is really amazing uh, when you get past people's uh, uh, memories, often repeated, um, and then uh, made more and more certain each time they're repeated, um, to um, go and look in my, uh, my files for the first time in many years um, and find, yes, here was this memo, and here were, were four authors, and I was the second author. Um, and uh, it's great to see Lynn Conway again. Uh, Lynn was that, uh, that f uh, first author. Now, uh, as a historian, uh, you know, looking at evidence and looking at it very carefully, um, I would confess 
that there is uh, there's more in the way of um, Britishisms, or however you want to call them, in, in that memo than probably in most other um, IBM documents. And so it's clear that at least as regards the writing, um, I had a, uh, a, a clear involvement. And to the extent that trusting my memory uh, uh, of those times, uh, what happened was that um, uh, this young graduate student came into Don and my room um, uh, with this um, uh, very simple and very elegant and very attractive idea um, for um, um, uh, scheduling um, sets of straight line code. Um, this was at a time uh, when the um, uh, instruction set uh, uh, already uh, had the, embodied the scheme of uh, the, to me, unattractive scheme of a first level decode into two separate streams, a fixed point stream and a floating point stream that were then executed independently of each other uh, with rather strange effects on the results that were being achieved, particularly if there was an interrupt. Um, and uh, what uh, was being suggested was a, a simpler, more elegant way, more general, potentially more powerful, of uh, uh, achieving uh, uh, such um, parallel activity. The, there was still the issue of uh, conditional branches. And there was this other scheme, which I also disliked, um, of um, separating the um, uh, calculation of the branch condition um, from the uh, uh, actual taking of the, um, uh, of the branch. Um, and I'm pretty sure, uh, but again, bear with me, I'm using my memory now, um, that um, Don and I uh, uh, worried about the conditional branching um, problem and came, out, uh, came up with uh, what, let, what I will arrogantly describe as thinking of Lin's um, uh, matrices, uh, an equally simple, equally elegant, and equally general um, uh, approach uh, to executing um, conditional branches um, uh, as, uh, as quickly as possible. And that was simply uh, by uh, uh, a scheme of obeying the instructions as much out of sequence as possible that was consistent with still getting the right answer. Um, <laughs> and giving total priority to conditional branches. Um, this is uh, something that's described in the, uh, in, in, in the memo, um, as is a uh, means of doing, uh, dealing with interrupts, um, fitting this together with um, memory interleaving and the lot. And, uh, and it really is, uh, though I say it myself, I shouldn't, um, a, a, a rather nice and rather um, uh, complete uh, and simple account of um, how to achieve uh, very high levels of, of parallelism by conceptually simple, even if logically expensive, uh, um, hardware. I was very enthusiastic about this. Um, it seemed to me that this um, uh, gave a much nicer uh, machine design, a much, much a nicer instruction set. Um, the instruction set, though I and Herb Shaw had, wor had worked on it um, at Yorktown Heights before I um, uh, moved out. Um, uh, in fact, I was the first one out here. Uh, my wife and I were expecting a baby. Um, we got here uh, and had to wait for all the others to come. That wasn't the only thing I was waiting for, clearly. <laughs> and my, uh, for all that I was involved in, uh, detailed design of that instruction set, my heart wasn't in it. And that was because of my earlier work. Um, I had been headhunted by IBM from English Electric where I'd been working on Algol compilers. Um, a condition of my coming, my condition of my coming, was that I did not go on working on compilers. Uh, uh, the work that I had done uh, was based um, uh, really quite strongly on the magnificent work of the, of the legendary Edgar Dijkstra. Um, uh, it was work that I had, uh, with a colleague, uh, had, uh, written up in a book, one of the first books on compilers, and I guess that was what had attracted the attention um, of, uh, of IBM. Um, but the compiler that we described was um, 
one which was not an optimizing compiler. It was uh, meant as one of a pair of compilers um, for the English Electric KDF9. Um, the other of which uh, was a, a very sophisticated, uh, opti uh, to be a very sophisticated optim uh, uh, optimizing compiler. But our, our compiler was intended to be um, a very fast compiler and a, a very good one for developing software. So essentially it was a semi-compiler. It compiled down to an instruction set which was much better than the KDF9 instruction set for programmers or compiler writers. My first machine uh, was one that was designed by Alan Turing, essentially. Alan Turing was as clever as anybody uh, uh, that we, we're talking about today, by a long chalk. Um, he didn't understand that programming was really rather difficult, um, and hence was quite prepared to uh, design a machine where you could get tremendous speed, um, a tremendous cost to the programmer. Um, the Deuce machine, um, uh, working at the same cycle uh, rate as a number of rival machines was capable of, being, uh, of getting very much um, higher performance on carefully coded programs. If, however, you looked at a, a complete um, uh, workload on that machine, uh, you found that uh, machines were doing a lot more uh, than, uh, than um, kernels. Uh, they had to do nasty things like get into and out of subroutines, uh, <coughs> starting and stopping what we would now call tasks jobs and so on, handling I.O. And uh, uh, those sorts of um, problems on KDF9 um, were uh, not being handled um, very well. So I diverted from saying that our compiler uh, design, uh, generated code for what we regarded as an ideal machine. Uh, Edgar Dijkstra and we effectively designed that. It was, I believe, the forerunner of what later became known as P-code. And indeed, I learned later uh, that um, our book describing this code uh, was used pretty extensively by Burroughs in, desi in designing the 6500 computer. So that was the sort of background I came um, from, that, com uh, that machines should be designed uh, to make uh, compilers and programmers, um, uh, uh, the, the life of compiler writers and programmers, as easy as possible. Um, so I was delighted by the dynamic instruction uh, scheme uh, system. Um, and was then absolutely appalled um, when somebody said, but we could use this scheme in each of the separate uh, uh, instruction schemes, uh, streams. Uh, we could have one set of the matrices for the fixed point and one for the floating point. Uh, I can't think of an appropriate set of words for use in mixed company uh, to describe my attitude to this. I wrote a memo called Clean Machine Design. Um, the essence of this memo was to say that uh, uh, you can uh, uh, take a set of separate uh, uh, architectural decis uh, decisions in design uh, designing an architecture and get well-argued optimal um, solutions to all of those. Um, but you must look at the overall result and see how it fits together. What clearly now did not fit together was me and ACS. Um, shortly afterwards, I found myself back at Yorktown Heights, um, where I uh, worked on multiprocessors and the like. I had a great time at ACS. Uh, I had a great time uh, at Yorktown Heights. One of my great regrets, however, is that I cannot find a copy of Clean Machine Design, that memo. Some years later, I was lecturing in Hong Kong, and I met the great T.C. Chen, who'd been involved in Stretch and um, many other things. And um, uh, talking to him, I found he remembered the memo with some affection, but he too did not have a copy of it. <laughs> the reason I am saying all this about the memo is if ever there was a chance of that memo reappearing, it's in front of this audience. <laughs> so, just one uh, other thing to, uh, to mention. Um, my uh, going back to Yorktown Heights, uh, Yorktown Heights from ACS, um, uh, that featured what I would describe as the, my biggest I told you so of my career. Uh, this was one year into ACS. Uh, I was leaving it, and I predicted um, that the project would not be able to retain its incompatibility with System 360. 
that it was not going to be possible um, to make at a technical political level uh, the arguments of the benefits that were being gained uh, from that different clever specially constructed instruction set. I said you are going to lose that argument and sometime after that you're going to be killed. And that I'm afraid is what, ha what happened. That is a great pity because it was a wonderful set of people, it was a great experience, my whole time in, in IBM was great experience and uh, a lot of my career afterwards benefited from that. And it's uh, been a privilege to try and give you this perhaps strange, perhaps overly British view of a wonderful American IBM project. Thank you. A group of us got together this morning, the uh, second panel, uh, myself, Billy Joe Mooney, and John Zazio, and we, um, we debated whether we would really talk about ACS or we would just tell John Cox stories. <laughs> this is, uh, there's a million John Cox stories. And I had the, uh, I had the great uh, privilege of not only working on ACS, but shortly after I joined the project and met John, we were both bachelors at the time, and John said, you know, Russ, we ought to get a good apartment together. Let's go in and get something really nice. So I said, all right. So we rented an apartment in Sharon Heights. We could actually walk across a couple of fairways to get to work if we chose to. So I had the uh, great privilege of spending all day at the laboratory working and all evening <laughs> talking with John over many Budweiser beers. It was, it, was, it was a wonderful experience, believe me. Uh, John had a, such a fertile mind, and uh, you could talk to John about anything and everything, and he had, he had opinions on everything. And he would walk around the laboratory, and you could always tell where he was, because he would smoke cigarettes, but he would, only, he would take a cigarette this long and perhaps smoke that much and put it out. And then he would go to the next place. And, expound about what they were doing. So you could follow him around by the cigarettes in the, uh, in the ashtrays where he had been that day. Now, the, um, uh, the, I could tell you some really wonderful stories about John, and we'll, we'll do this at the, uh, at the reception tonight because I can tell you stories that illustrate how broad his, his mind was in all of the different areas that he worked in and thought about, you know, continuously all day long. So, at any rate, my first exposure to ACS, I was in Poughkeepsie, and I was working on the Model 50 in the 360 series, and the machine had just gone into production, and so we were marking time, uh, waiting for our next assignment. And I was reporting to Jerry Paul, and Jerry called me into his office one day, and he said, uh, Russ, uh, how would you like to join the ACS laboratory in California. I said, what's ACS? Well, he said, this is a project, a new project, to build the world's fastest computer, and right now it's populated mostly research people, build the world's fastest computer. What do you think? I said, the world's fastest computer, yes. In California, yes. I said, well, you've given me the pros, what are the cons? <laughs> So Jerry said, well, look, you're single, Russ. Uh, you don't have a family to move. Personally, I don't think there are any. I said, I can't either. So I'm leaving. When do I leave? <laughs> and so out I came to California and, um, and got to meet this group from research. Now, this was an extraordinary group of guys. They were, I would characterize them, and I think everybody probably in the engineering organization would probably have similar, similar first impressions to these people. They were all very bright, very bright people. And they knew a lot about computers, a lot. And they knew about operating systems. And they knew about compilers. And they were nice guys. They were easy to talk to. And they weren't wearing t-shirts and Mickey Mouse watches. Now, <laughs> In Poughkeepsie, I had only one exposure to research. I went down to have a meeting down there and with some of the research people, and two of the guys came in the room, and they had T-shirts on with some crazy thing on it. And one guy was wearing a Mickey Mouse watch. Now, in Poughkeepsie, we had to wear ties, and you know, we had to look respectable. 
you know, uh, wingtip shoes and so forth. So this was a bit of a shock to me when I met these fellows. So ACS group was totally different. Now, to appreciate why this project was so, um, uh, how should I say, so exciting to all of us, you know, there was great enthusiasm and uh, it was different than what we had been accustomed to. So let me just step back to Poughkeepsie and talk a little bit about 360. When 360 was, was conceived, it was conceived to take, a, take all of these different machines that IBM was building and come up with one architecture that could be implemented in many different forms from the Model 30 with one, one byte wide data flow all the way up to the Model 75. And the architecture was designed to be independent of the hardware. Great, a lot of thought went in to do that. So that the job of the engineering organization was to take this architecture and build varying performance machines. And what would happen was the, the architecture group would essentially modify this as we went along. It was, a, it was a work in progress. And they would hand it over the wall to each of us and we would go ahead and, and, and design to this, to this specification. Now, the Model 50, which I worked on, was in some sense the easiest machine to build. It was a 32-bit architecture, 32 bits to memory. And if you looked at the 360 architecture, it sort of jumped out at you. This was 32-bit architecture. So on the bottom end, the Model 30 people trying to do this one byte wide, I would have hated to have had to, to have had to microcode double precision floating point, a byte at a time. That must have been very tricky. And at the other end, we had the Model 75, which was an overlap machine, had an I unit and an E unit. And the Model 75, in some sense, was the hardest machine to build because they didn't have a lot of advantage in circuitry. They, say they used the same circuitry that the 65 used. And so the only way they could get high performance was to overlap an I unit and an E unit. Now, the Model 50, was a very straightforward machine. Fetched an instruction from memory, decoded it. About five cycles later, you had the answer. Six cycles, 500 nanosecond cycle. If you work out the numbers, that's a two megahertz machine. Now, all of you out there today, in your laptops, carrying around your briefcase, you have a two gigahertz machine. Now, that's a factor of a 1,000. So you're carrying around your briefcase a machine that was a thousand times faster than the Model 50 in your briefcase. Now, 40 years have gone by, so you'd expect some progress, but a thousand times in your briefcase, that was, that was a bit of a, bit of a, none of us would have believed that that was possible. Now, going, the 75 had a lot of stretch people. And as a matter of fact, there was a lot of stretch people in all of the organizations, all of the different machine projects, the 65, the 50, and the 75, uh, because there was a lot of stretch guys, and stretch ended just about the time 360 was starting, and so we had a lot of these fellows. 75 in particular had a lot of, a lot of these people. So the first wave of people coming out to ACS, I was part of it, and there were a lot of people from the 75. So what we saw when we got here was perhaps less daunting to them than it was to me, because I had only worked on a very simple machine. They had worked on more complex machines. And I remember how this came home to me very strong when after being out here for a short period of time and talking, I spent a lot of time with Ed Sussenguth and, and Charlie Fryman and Phil Dauber. But when the uh, execution units were explained to me and I realized that the floating point multiplier was larger than the entire Model 50. This was, this was a little scary, a little scary. So as it's been pointed out, in order to build the world's fastest computer, you have to attack at all, all fronts. So as you're gonna hear from John Zaz, John was working on the circuitry, very advanced circuitry, levels of integration. I won't get into that, I won't steal uh, John's thunder. And, and Billy Joe Mooney was working on the I.O. So you got this extremely powerful machine. You got to feed this thing. You got to get I.O. in. And that was a very complex uh, aspect of the thing. Now, the, um, the job of the engineering organization, as you know, is you take, 
You take an architecture and you have to design and build what, these, what has been specified. Now, unlike Poughkeepsie, where the architectural definition was given us, and then we had sort of free reign as to how we were going to build this. We had a target. We had to build a machine at a certain performance and a certain cost. Where in ACS, we were going to build the world's fastest computer. And so the architecture group and the engineering group had to work much more closely together than was the case in Poughkeepsie. And when we, what I was nervous about when I got out here was that maybe we were just going to give a lot, we were going to give them a lot of abstract ideas. You know, let's do out of order execution. Uh, you know, let's look eight deep in the instruction stream and try to, try to start three or four instructions. I had no idea how, how that could be done. And when I arrived and started talking with Ed and the other people, I found out that they had thought through this thing very carefully. And they really were not just handing me a spec, they were saying, here's how you can do it. As, as Lynn has pointed out, some of the algorithms were already worked out. And so the job was to translate this paper design into hardware. Now, all of you out there who have built machines, you know that a lot of things can happen between the paper and the hardware. And we were, built, we were going to design with a short cycle in Poughkeepsie. All of the machines usually had 10 plus levels of logic between, in a clock pulse. And here we were going to design to, we started out at five, probably got up to more like six or eight. But this was a different way to design. So there was also that aspect of it that, was, that added a lot of complexity in, in, in trying to do the design. Now, we all have to tell our little stories. And I, uh, I, I worked with Ed. Ed was a terrific guy. Ed was just wonderful to work with. And, uh, but I also uh, had to work with Phil Dauber. Is Phil here? here? Ah, good. I can tell stories about you, Phil. So I had the privilege of working with Phil and Charlie Fryman on what we call the bus lining module. Now, this was really the memory bus. Now, we couldn't call it the memory bus. IBM had said, don't use the word memory. You can't use the word memory because that has a certain human connotation to it. And we don't want people to think that these machines really have memories and they really can think, you know, so we couldn't use that way. We had to use storage. So we, you'll, if you notice all the documents that Mark has put together, you'll notice that Memory, as we know it today, is called storage. And finally, after a while, the world started calling memory. So finally, IBM gave up and said, OK, you can call it memory. So this, this unit that Phil and Charlie and I started designing. Now, Charlie, Charlie is no longer with us. Charlie was a um, uh, very sort of, he always struck me as impatient. He, he, he had, was very quick. And if you weren't keeping up with him, he would get a little annoyed. Now, Phil, on the other hand, was the new kid. We call him the kid, because he was young, and he just came out of Michigan with a PhD. And he was a whirling dervish. I mean, when you worked with Phil, you had the sense that Phil's mind was going 1,000 miles an hour. And when he was talking to you in short bursts, he was, his mind, what he was telling you was not what he was thinking. He was already thinking way ahead. And so, and, and, he, and only, only 30 minutes could go by before Phil had to go get a candy bar and rejuvenate, get his energy level back up. <laughs> so we started designing this thing. Now, the, the, the unit was, it was the first time I'd seen a cache. Now, we all know that caches are a, a wonderful invention. I don't know what we'd do if we didn't have caches today, because if we all know logic was going like this to the moon in performance, and DRAM was going like this, and this gap was widening, and if you didn't have some way to bridge that gap, you weren't going to get very much performance. And of course, the high-speed store and the notion of the cache is what made all that possible. Now, when it was explained to me, the cache conceptually is not really a complicated thing. I mean, you've got a tag memory, and you know, you look at it and you say, well, that looks pretty reasonable. I can understand how, that, how I could implement that. And the thing that was amazing about cache was, how well it worked. The fact that you could 99% of the time find what you were looking for in the cache. That was, I, I mean, I, I was startled when I realized that. So, of course, that really made the performance. Now, what hadn't been thought about really well was if you miss in the cache, then you have to go to main memory. 
and you have to bring out a line of data and all the complications. That. Furthermore, what was coming in on every cycle, now remember the Model 50, one thing went to memory, got it, and that was it. Here we're trying to send an I.O. request for a word, an instruction for a, a group of words, and two data simultaneously coming in every cycle, and we're pipelining this thing. So we started on the design, and I would sit there, and I was listening. You know, these guys were calling him, moving along, and, and every once in a while I'd say, wait a minute, guys, hold on. What happens if this condition and that condition and such and such? And Phil would say, that's interesting. Let's put that off on the side. We'll come back to that. Oh, so we'd go on, you know, maybe another day. Guys, I, I, you know, what about this and this and this? How do we then? That's a good question, but let's put it on the side, Russ. So this went on, and finally one day I said, guys, we got to stop. Um, you know, we got a lot of stuff over here on the side, and, and I'm getting very nervous about this. You guys are very smart guys, and I suspect you know exactly how this is all going to work, but I don't. And so I'm going to, to take a couple of days. You guys, can you find something else? Give me a couple of days to think about this, see if I can get my hands around it. So it was agreed, and they went off. And I sat for a couple of days thinking, how in the world are we going to make this thing work? And then I had one of these, aha, I, you know, one of those great flashes. Bobby Ball had them. Suddenly, I could see a, a structure of how we could do this. And I was very, very excited about this. And I ran down the hall to find Charlie and to find Phil. And I pulled him out of the meeting, took him back to my office, sat him down. And I said, guys, I got to, I got to listen, listen, listen to my idea. So I explained this, this idea to him. Now, how great an invention was this? I don't know. It was kind of a revolver thing, and I won't go into the details. But I will tell you this. In those days, it was very common to reinvent something five times. You know, like carry look ahead adders. Probably five guys could say they invented a carry look ahead adder because there was no communication. You know, somebody would invent something over here or to figure it out, and you wouldn't know about it. So you'd have to figure it out for yourself a second time. So I suspect that what I had come up with was probably maybe even in stretch and didn't know about it. At any rate, I get the guys, and, and, and so what happens? Before Charlie could say a word, Phil says, Russ, that's a great idea. And he goes up to my blackboard, and he says, you realize that that will solve? And he writes five things on my blackboard. And he grabs Charlie, and they leave. I sat there for a good 10 minutes on each one of those five before I said, my God, he's right, it does do that. <laughs> now, that was Phil. I mean, Phil was, John Cock, John Cock warned me about Phil very early on. He said, um, he said, Phil is a very bright guy. And he says he's very quick, very quick. If you give him a problem and Phil can't solve it in five minutes, he's probably not going to solve it. But he can solve some really complex stuff in five minutes. So I had some great experiences with Phil. And it was, it was great. And that was, that was what went on around the laboratory and in almost every place you went. It was, it was really exciting stuff, exciting stuff. Now, it was also unnerving. And I would say the thing that was unnerving was that we were going to build this out of new technology. We were going to have 40, 30 to 40 circuits on a chip. And you can't go on a chip and cut a land and put a jumper. Now, that was a big, very big concern, and I think, I, I remember, I would sometimes wake up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat, and my cold sweat was, Jesus, how are we ever going to debug this machine? You know, this is really a complicated, and it was 300,000 circuits, 300,000 circuits. Stretch was 169,000 transistors, which translate to about 20,000 circuits, so this was a massive machine. Massive machine. When you start doing pipelining, you know, uh, adders and multipliers, they get very large. But the thing that worried me was the controls. You know, building the controls for this thing was going to be a very, a very difficult task. So, so where did where does all this take us? And um, and it's a, it's it's really ironic that last Tuesday. IBM announced the availability of the Power 7 chip, okay? Now, this Power 7 chip has a, has a processor on it, and I'm going to read you the specifications of what this processor has in it. It has two 
fixed point units, two load stores, four double precision floating point execution units. These are all independent execution units in this processor. One decimal unit. I don't know why they have a decimal unit, perhaps to calculate the size of the national deficit, I don't know. <laughs> uh, one branch unit, one condition unit. A 32 kilobyte instruction cache, 32 kilobyte data cache. They split the cache that was an innovation that came along later. And 32 megabytes of, I'm sorry, a second level cache of 256 kilobytes. This was the processor. Now, but they don't call it the processor, they call it the core. And there are eight of these on the chip. Eight, okay? You know, the chip is about an inch on a side, slightly rectangular, four on the top, four on the bottom. Now, as they say on TV, there's more. <laughs> In the middle of this thing, they put 32 megabytes of DRAM memory. 32 megabytes of DRAM. Now, I mean, it's mind-boggling. You know, if any of us back 40 years ago had said there would be a chip today that had a, a, a processor on it that exceeded the ACS, eight of them on one chip, with, eight, with 32 megabytes of memory, you'd say, forget it. What are you smoking here? I mean, this is no way this is going to happen. So it was, ACS was an amazing time. It was, it was, as John said, it was the most exciting thing. And for me, it was certainly the most exciting thing, as it's been said shortly after that, I left IBM. And I left IBM because, as Brian said, and I agree with him wholeheartedly, I could not see how ACS was going to continue. There was no way that, that a 360 could be developed on the West Coast. Uh, one of the problems with ACS was that the checks were written by Poughkeepsie. All of our money went through Poughkeepsie. And Poughkeepsie used to refer to the ACS project as Paley's Palace by the Pacific. You know, here were these guys out there spending a lot of money and, uh, you know, what, what was really going on out there. So I saw that the end was coming and I decided that there was a lot of talented people in this organization that were going to get scattered to the wind. A lot of them were going to go back to Poughkeepsie and where God knows where they're going to go. And maybe this was an opportunity to bring these, to get these people to leave IBM and start a computer company. So my motivation was more the availability of some really good people rather than a burning idea about what I wanted to build or what the company, what the company should build. And, and later on as a venture capitalist, you find, and we all know that most entrepreneurs start out with the burning idea of what they want to do and then they find the people to support it and I sort of went the other way around. So it was a great project. It was the people were wonderful, and we all learned uh, an enormous amount uh, from the project. Now, my wife is going to give me, have I all my time shots? Oh, oh, you give me a hand signal, I haven't been paying attention. I see I've all gone over my time. So, John Sazio is now going to tell you about the technology, and then Billy is going to tell you about the I.O., and Billy's going to tell you a wonderful story. So stick around. Don't go away until he leaves. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm the uh, hardware guy, so I brought hardware. <laughs> I don't expect you to be able to see this from out there, and most of you who are on the team with me will have a difficult time seeing it when it's on the table right in front of you, but <laughs> come around afterwards uh, for those of you who haven't seen some of this. This is a little history of, you know, before ACS, ACS is kind of in the middle here, and where we went after that. Um, the Technology for the project was a chip that was about 50 thousandths of an inch square, dissipated three and a half watts. We put 25 of the, we put it in a little flat pack, a quad flat pack that was a tenth of an inch on the outside. Uh, it had a stud on the backside for cooling in a liquid fluorocarbon. 44 leads on the package, there were five mil leads on 10 mil centers. It was, it was a difficult package to make. We Can took, no. I'm sorry, <clears throat> thank you. <laughs> Difficult package to make, and um, the package went on a multi-chip module that was about the size of this integrated circuit package that we built many years later. Uh, a 256-pin package that had 25 chips on it. 
that had liquid freon flowing across it uh, to cool it. And, and I remember the, it was a, a fluorocarbon made by 3M called FC78. It was more expensive per gallon than the best scotch you could buy. <laughs> and one afternoon uh, during lunch break, somebody accidentally left the control valve the, on the, uh, the, the freon, uh, the cooling system open. And the equivalent of a new Cadillac drained out on the floor and evaporated in about a half an hour. <laughs> uh, anyway, the, uh, this is a wafer from the project. They were one inch wafers. Uh, uh, quite small at the time, but uh, uh, quite interesting. Um, a little bit about the, the, the culture and the people. Uh, when we did this project, we really didn't have the kind of tools that we have today. There was no spice, there was no test equipment companies, there were, uh, uh, it, it was basically, you know, do whatever you had to do yourself, figure out how to do it. And we're a bunch of free thinkers up there. And, you know, John Cock was one of them. Uh, John would come into my office once every couple of weeks and spend about an hour and a pack of cigarettes uh, as, as Russ said, he didn't really smoke the cigarettes, he kind of chewed them and I'd end up with a filthy ashtray at the end, but he, he was full of wonderful ideas. And it, one, of the, one of the interesting difficulties at the time was, okay, we now how to, to build these circuits, we went down to Motorola to buy them, how are we going to test them? There were no test equipment companies around, there was a, a, a group of people in Poughkeepsie that made custom hardware that would test integrated circuits, but they had only gotten up to 16 pin devices. And when I went back there to see them, they, you know, they, well, okay, we'll build this for you, but it's a massive project, a massive custom development. And I was explaining this to John, and John said, you know, maybe you could just use a general purpose computer to do all of this. Why don't you get down to IBM in San Jose and take a look at this 1800 that BJ Mooney put together. He says, it's got a digital box on the side of it and an analog box. And, can't you just kind of hook up a socket to that and make it all work? And by God, that's what we did. Uh, we hooked the sampling oscilloscope up to it and made circuit delay measurements in the uh, few dozen picosecond range. Uh, and you know, today that's the way all test equipment is, is built. Uh, general purpose computers are wonderful compared to uh, custom parts. The, the second major thing I wanted to talk about is the, the educational experience of working in IBM and Poughkeepsie and then coming to Silicon Valley. Basically what this project taught me how to do was how to do a startup. Um, you didn't have to buy the transistors from the semiconductor division of IBM. You didn't have to get the printed circuit board from the IBM printed circuit uh, company. You, uh, you didn't have to go to the IBM model shop. There were thousands of little companies out here to support this project. Uh, and there were printed circuit companies down the street, and I had a choice of hundreds of different model shops to go get, you know, pieces made. Um, and uh, it, it, it was a culture that you could do anything with a small group of people and the right support organization around you. Um, so when the IBM project folded, it was very difficult for me to think about going back to Poughkeepsie and getting back into this large organization. So I'm, I got an offer from Russ to go into MassCore. And uh, that was a wonderful experience. It was you know, a, a difficult experience. We knew how to build technology, but we didn't know a lot about the marketing and sales aspects, so it was not a successful venture. But uh, Gene Omdahl, who's in the audience today, uh, uh, a year and a half later, uh, got funding for a startup and uh, hired a group of us to put the technology together for that system. Uh, and we came to that with the experience of all the materials and equipment and support in Silicon Valley, and what it was like to go through a, a company that didn't quite make it, worth running out of money. So when we got to Omdahl, we, we essentially picked everything that was absolutely sure we could make it. We, we had a package that was twice as many pins. The leads were 20 mils on, or 10 mil leads on 20 mil centers so you could physically make it. Um, at, at, it and I think we started there with, well, with the experience of all the people. Uh, we, we knew how to talk to each other and how to design this thing. We went from opening the doors to having a cross-sectional working model of the machine in nine months. And with that, Gene was able to go to Fujitsu and raise the second round of funding and, and uh, made a successful company. So 
what I got out of this project was a really bright group of people, uh, a, a, a culture that taught you that you could do almost anything if you could, you know, you, 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 with the support team you had and figure it out yourself. And uh, this is a great place to work in California. I, I have a hard time going back to Poughkeepsie. So I thank all of you who supported me and worked with me at ACS, and it's good to see you all again. Thank you. <laughs> Well, I'm the tail end. <laughs> and I won't be up here long. Uh, there's uh, a couple of things I would like to talk about. One is the precursor. I had the I.O. system in the ACS, and I built the precursor. And the precursor was uh, a sing it wasn't the MCM. It was a single chip, and we uh, had 600 and something of them on a single plane. And this plane would generate about 1,800 watts. So we had to have some hellacious cooling. And, of course, we used the FC-78 as the coolant. Yeah, and, and this, this is the precursor board right here. And uh, what, what I did in the precursor, I built a 24-bit adder. I had five levels of logic, which is what we one of the design points we was trying to achieve. I had five levels of logic between each latch point so that we I could run it at 10 nanoseconds. So I actually ran the precursor that I built at 10 nanoseconds. Uh, that, so that's what I, I also had the I.O. responsibility, but this, the precursor is the only thing that uh, I ever built there. The, there is uh, one little story though I'd like to tell you and then I'll get the heck off of here. As I got a phone call at three o'clock in the morning, and it was from Dr. Bertram. And, and he said, Mooney, you're on your way to work, aren't you? And I said, what? <laughs> and, and, and he said, you are on your way to work. And oh, by the way, I want you to have this problem solved when you get here. And well, I lived, out of Los Gatos over Lexington, Lexington, Lexington Reservoir. So it was about 50 miles, so I had an hour to think about the problem. Well, I didn't have it solved when I got there. And a couple of days later, I had it solved. I went into him, and I gave him the solution to the problem. And I said, Dr. Bertram, I don't know, he had I don't know, two or three PhDs. I said, You've got a couple hundred PhDs here. Why in the hell did you call me? He said, let me tell you something, Mooney. He says, I can talk to either, any one of those boys. And he said, you know, I can ask them how to cross Sand Hill Road. And each one of them can give me at least a half dozen algorithms how to cross the road. But not a damn one of them can cross it without getting run over. What a uh, tough act to follow. What a great group. Uh, thank you so much for being here today and for sharing all those stories. Let's please give everyone a round of applause uh, once again.